Good morning. Welcome to Auchincroove Church in the parish of St Clovix. My name's Eileen and I'm going to be one of your guides on this blustery morning around this very much loved old church. Good morning, I'm Gwyn. The church has a very active congregation. This is our minister, the Reverend John McCutcheon. And we had a wedding in the church just the Saturday before lockdown. Right, here we go. Thanks, Gwyn. Here we are in St Quivex churchyard. The church used to be called St Quivex, but now the parish is referred to as St Quivex, and this is called Ochencrove Church. This is the east elevation of the church. And you can see very clearly that there are a number of different parts to the building. Over on the left, the first part is the 1500s original building. Then moving to the middle, we have the extension that was built on in 1767 with a redder brick. And then at the far end, the crypt which was built in 1825 to house the Oswald tombs. But we'll hear more of these as we walk around. So starting with the oldest part of the building, this is the east wall of the oldest part of the building now. This building was originally based on a monastery the earliest known records of which go back to 1208. Only the foundations of the monastery remain now, but these cannot be seen here. You'll notice there are two doors, one up to a gallery, the top door, and a bottom door, which is set into the wall here, but of which no trace remains on the inside. This was the original entrance that the priest would go in, but has been bricked up inside. But remember it because it's the one that, that will uh, let you know whereabouts we are once we go into the church. And I'm going to walk now towards the south wall so that you can see the oldest part of the church here. Now there has been a Christian presence we know on the site of Ochencrove Church since the 1200s. Its earliest mention was from 1208 mm -hmm. and from 1238 the church was owned by Paisley Abbey until the Reformation when the church fell into disrepair. The medieval building was restored in 1595 on the original 13th century foundations by Alan, the fourth Lord Cathcart, who at the time owned the Sundrum and Ochencrove estates and was patron of St Quivex Church. At that time, it was built, as you can see, as a simple long hall running along the current pulpit wall. The pulpit and chancel were thought to be, as we've seen on the east wall, with a covered in door on that wall, serving as an entrance for the priest. The restoration was marked by a stone panel on the outside south wall of the church, which we'll see in a moment. Made of sandstone, this has worn badly over the last four centuries, but bears the date 1595, the Cathcart coat of arms and the motto, I hope to speed. Here we can see the panel with the 1595 date, very difficult to make out, and what you can no longer see is the, the motto, I hope to speed. Underneath the old plaque is the modern plaque commemorating the 400 year anniversary of the first restoration. Moving now to the west side of the church, you can see here another uh, outside entrance, this time into the Whitlitz Gallery. The upper classes then had their own separate entrances into their own galleries. It's a very simple single bell in the belfry and we ring it for five minutes or so 
before the start of every Sunday morning service. It's great fun to ring it. And the gallery door here is also the door by which we access the bell chain. Now moving to the north side of the building, you can see this 1825 extension with its beautiful arched window. This was built to house the crypt containing the tombs of the Oswald family of Ochen Kruv. Right, let's pop inside and see what we can see. Here we are now inside the church. It's a beautiful old church. I'm going to take you down this near aisle. So that you can see the old door that I mentioned. So that you can orientate yourself. So the priest would have come in this door, climbed to the pulpit and looked down the long axis of the old church. The pulpit, the modern day pulpit, is on this old long south wall that you saw before. The pews would all have been facing towards where we are just now. The galleries would not have been there at that time. So in 1767, Richard Oswald planned a new restoration, the second restoration of the church. And that added the leg of the T onto the church. The pews are 1767 and you can see the Ochenkruve gallery up there. And that was where the household and family of the Oswalds of Ochenkruve would sit during the church services. Moving over to the Whitlets Gallery, this housed the household and servants of the Whitlets Farm. And up there was also the bell, the access to the bell tower. Here's the old pulpit, 1767 again, oak panelled with a heavy oak panelled sounding board above the pulpit. Looking out now from the pulpit, you can see the Ochenkruve gallery for the Oswald family. And you can see now the T-shaped structure of the church. So this is the main body of the church. And we're leading off now to the right with the Craigie gallery above. And again, coming back to the main body of the church. And to the left, the Whitlitz Gallery. Now up in the Whitlitz Gallery, you'll perhaps be able to see the chain that goes up to the bell. And as I say, we ring this every Sunday when there's a service on in Ochenkruve Church. Now also from the top, from the pulpit here, you might be able to make out that the rows are curved. The rows of pews are curved. And this gives a lovely impression of being held in a, almost sort of an embrace really, when you're standing at the front of the church. Up at the back here, there's a rather strange black ornamental lozenge shaped object. And that is a funerary hatchment. More of that later. The pulpit fall here was gifted uh, by one of the members of the church and rather lovely. It has on it some diamonds. You can see them here and a few round the cross. And each of these diamonds represents one of the lady's grandchildren. The lectern fall here was made by members of the church and it represents the burning bush. 
An interesting fact about the church is that three ministers came from the same family, the Wilson family, the Reverend J. Wilson, the Reverend J. P. Wilson, and the Reverend W. L. B. Wilson. And as you can see, they served as ministers here from 1859 continuously through to 1978. And this plaque commemorates a hundred years of service to the church by that family. Some achievement. Here you can see the old numbering on the pews. Wonder when that was done. The blown air central heating system. The old organ. still works. You have to pump up the bellows using your feet. And once you get enough steam. The war memorial to those of the parish who lost their lives in the First World War. And in the Second World. for the doorknob enthusiasts amongst us. Look at this. How beautiful is that? What an action. Now here we are outside the church again and we're going to go through this door. This is like that children's programme, what's behind the blue door. Now, here we have a set of stairs to the left and a room to the right. Gravestones contained in the crypt are very rarely uncovered. So this door's open day has given us the chance to have a closer look at them, to take the carpet off, the harbour off and start to see the, the graves again. And gives the opportunity for us all to learn something more of the remarkable history that lies on our very doorstep. The earliest gravestone is of Richard Oswald. He was a successful merchant who cultivated important connections between powerful people in his day. He had large land holdings in British North America, but sadly was also an active slave trader, carrying slaves from his island in Sierra Leone to work in his sugar and tobacco plantations. And he amassed a considerable fortune and wealth from this abhorrent activity. He was appointed advisor to Lord Shelbourne, the British Prime Minister, in 1782, and his knowledge of North America led him to become one of the foremost British negotiators at the 1783 Paris Peace Conference with the American colonies. In America, he's known as the peacemaker for his work in drafting the peace treaty, which ended the American War of Independence. Mary Oswald, Richard's widow, was the daughter of a wealthy landowner in Jamaica, and the marriage had brought her husband much more land in America. She died in London, and her funeral cortege stopped in Sankar on its way back to St Quivex. Rooms were needed for the party, and the poet Robert Burns was forced out of his room in the inn, into the storm, to ride a further 12 miles on his horse Pegasus to New Cumnock. His displeasure at being outranked by a rich corpse, was given full vent in his poem, Ode, Sacred to the Memory of Mrs Oswald of Hoffman Crew. Louisa Lucy Johnson was a celebrated beauty of her day. Robert Burns dedicated his poem, 
or what he was on yon town to her. The words with the words, and she, as fairest is her form, she has the truest, kindest heart. She was a skilled musician and dancer. She wrote the music to Burns' song, Thou Lingering Star. And many of her comp compositions are in the Neil Gow collections. Her portrait was painted by Sir Henry Rayburn. After the death of Lucy's husband Richard, and then his cousin James Oswald, the Glasgow tobacco merchant, the ownership of Auchincrovy estate passed to Alexander Haldane Oswald, MP for Ayrshire at the time. Unfortunately, we have no information at the present time about the occupants of the last two tombs, Richard Oswald and Margaret Dundas. Now we're going to go upstairs to the Ochen Kruv Gallery. Just mind my steps on the way up. You can see that this rather luxurious door is padded in velvet, naturally. Now we're coming up here into the Ochen Kruv Gallery. And you'll begin to see there's a bit of a class difference going on here. And the tasseled velvet front pad here, we can see now into the church and there you can see the pulpit again, the Whitlips Gallery and the Craigie Gallery. And from up here, you can also see that gentle curve on the pews. This gallery gives a real indication of the class differences at the time. Downstairs, we have the hard wooden seats for the ordinary people of the parish, as they might have been regarded by the people who sat up here they sat on comfortable padded chairs, armchairs, or on padded pews with a velvet padded back. This now is the doorway that marks the difference between the front of the gallery and the back of the gallery. And you can see now here that even up in the gallery, there's a bit of a class difference going on. The hard wooden pews for the rest of the household, the servants. And if we look here, move in more closely, you can see a bit of the graffiti. Men in top hats. You'll notice this large structure um, holding pretty much the, the whole of the roof up. Um, this must have been put in place um, during the extension in 1767. Um, if you look at it from the roof space, um, you would see that it is housed in a channel, um, but within that channel um, are huge planks of wood, um, about f four inches um, in, in um, depth, um, which are knitted together um, like plywood, um, braced at various places with huge steel um, bolts. Um, they're obviously then braced um, on the outside with this structure that you can see underneath the column. Um, it was apparently checked by um, surveyors in um, the 1970s and found to um, be completely and utterly uh, intact and showing no signs of great strain. It's a wonderful piece of, of work from the builders of the day. So the, this is one of the two funerary hatchments that we have here. Um, now these were 
really identified as such by chance. Uh, we had seen them lying around the church for a, a very long time. Um, and whilst we were doing the roof repairs, they got very close to being uh, removed forever from this church because uh, they really were in the way. However, <clears throat> we managed to find that they wear these things called funerary hatchments. Um, a funerary hatchment is a depiction within a black lozenge-shaped frame. Um, and it's of the deceased's heraldic achievements. Indeed, the word hatchment comes from an old version of the word achievement. Um, the family crest is there together with indications of the supporters of that person and family. Um, they were placed over the entrance to the nobleman's house um, and displayed there for a period of about 40 days, after which they were removed to the local church. This one, without a doubt, has the, the elements of the Oswald family. Um, and the one downstairs that we saw earlier um, has both Oswald and Haldane family elements. We don't know that exact date, um, but they are significantly old from looking at the wood. There are probably two occupants of Acre that are likely candidates. That is Richard Oswald himself, known as the peacemaker, after his uh, work in writing the peace treaty, which eventually rendered the American War of Independence. Um, he died in 1784. And Alexander Haldane Oswald, um, who died in 1868, who was the MP for this area. Here we are, up in the Craigie Gallery now. We're looking over at the Whitlocks Gallery and the Ochen Cruve Gallery. And what I particularly wanted to show you up here are these rows of pegs. These are not for your coats because you'll see they're quite long. They are in fact for your top hats, which I hope you're wearing while you're watching this video, since you are up with the posh people in the gallery. We're going to make our way out of the Craigie Gallery now and down the private staircase so that we don't mix with any of the general congregation and find our way into the churchyard. William Henry Playfair was one of the greatest Scottish architects of the 19th century and the designer of many of Edinburgh's neoclassical landmarks in the new town. This miniature Greek revival temple, built as a mausoleum to the Campbells of Craigie, was in fact contemporary with his masterpiece of the Royal Scottish Academy on the mound in Edinburgh. Interestingly, his uncle, uh, his father's brother, also called William, was an economist and a pioneer of information graphics. And he was the first person to display information in the form of a graph. Many of the gravestones have carved depictions of death on them, such as this one with the skull and crossbones underneath. This is a particularly fine example of an Adam and Eve gravestone. The figures have unusually long legs, giving them a rather modern appearance. These were very expensive monuments, and for that reason, probably, there are very few of them to be found now in Scotland. I wonder if he told everyone about his old school pal, Walter. Uh, we're going to use a technique to see if we can make this date stand out more clearly. So we're going to spray it with shaving foam. Work it in. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's amazing. 
13th of September, 1657. What we're doing is spreading shaving foam over a, the design on the stone here. And we're looking to see if we can get some, um, an idea of what's actually underneath. So we can see quite clearly the design of these, um, these heraldic design. And there's a, a can you see if you can get this, this number here, this after the two, open that up a wee bit, oh, another 22. What? And this is Ata. So this this is um, this person died at the age of twenty two. I'm trying to open up this. I'll do a bit more up at the top there. Yeah, I've got the thirty five. So they died at the age of thirty five. And at the top here, I'm just trying to see what's on this heraldic shield. It's not quite so easy to see. Maybe maybe once you scrape it down. Right, oh, that's much easier to see now. Now we can see two sort of either lions or unicorns and we can see the, the rest of the shield coming out. So this is a shield of one person who died age 35 and another age 22. And what we need to do now is find out the families to whom this shield belongs. Oh, this looks like the name, something or other. Who that was obviously goes down to who departed. Departed this. I'm going to say life might be next. Yeah. Life Why? the 1660. Sixteen sixty four. Oh, there's more more letters coming up now. Where was it that you got this idea from? Mm, the people in Cadu. Margaret. Kennedy. Yeah, it is the Kennedy. Margaret Kennedy. Mm. His yeah. spouse. The stone finally read William Wallace, younger, of Holmston, who departed this life the something of April 1664, and Margaret Kennedy, his spouse. We were now able to definitely connect this grave to the Kennedys of Culloden. Margaret was the daughter of Alexander and Agnes Kennedy of Culloden. Well, here we are at the end of our tour around this beautiful old Ochenkruve church and its churchyard. I hope you've enjoyed your visit. If you want to find out more, please visit our website on www airstquivox.com Thank you for coming to visit. It's been lovely to have you here. <laughs>